So today's announcements are, um, I finished up the exam regrades over the weekend. I haven't posted them online yet on Canvas, but I'm, I'm going to be getting into that this morning. Um, but I do have the exams here if you want to come pick yours up. <coughs> After today's lectures, I'll distribute them back out to the TA so you can grab them in recitation. Um, and then Sapling Chapter 23 is due 9 a.m. Wednesday. 24 is due at the final exam, which is going to be Sunday. Or, uh, no, the exam itself is Wednesday next week, 7.30 a.m. in Math 100. And the review session is Sunday, 10.30 a.m. in Dwayne G. 1.30. Okay, um, any questions about those things? All right, cool. Okay, so um, last lecture we started Chapter 24, so we're looking at carbohydrates. Um, so we looked at... Um, Fisher projections, which are very useful for handling that many stereocenters in a molecule, and how to sort of convert back and forth between Fisher and zigzag or skeletal stuff. We also looked at L versus D sugars, um, and we started looking at cyclization. So what we're going to cover today is something that's sort of analogous to Fisher projections, but for the cyclized form. Because again, we still have a ton of stereocenters on there. We need some way of systematically keeping track of where our stereocenters are pointing without having to resort to bold and dashed, just because that has a lot of different ways you could draw it, and converting back and forth is complicated. Um, OK. So where we left off last time is, if you start out with um, a Fisher projection, and the example that we saw last time was this. OK, so OH is, I'm just keeping them left, uh, right, left, left, left. So for anyone who missed last time and hasn't gotten a chance to look at the notes, <clears throat> carbohydrates um, are going to be this carbon chain backbone, and then pretty much every carbon along the chain has an H and an OH coming off of it, except for one carbon, which has a carbonyl. Um, most frequently, we're going to, be look, going to be looking at aldehyde sugars. Um, so these have the carbonyl on an N carbon. And so we also have a CH2OH down at the bottom end. We're not showing um, the crossbar for this one because it's not a stereocenter. OK. So what we saw last time is when you cyclize a carbohydrate, um, most commonly you're going to make five or six membered rings. So if we want to make a six membered ring, three, four, five carbons, and then the sixth atom of the ring is the oxygen coming off of there, and that's the one that whips around and sort of cyclizes onto the carbonyl. 
So if we draw this without showing stereochemistry, we're going to have, so carbons one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then oxygen six is the one that closes the ring down. That's the ring oxygen now that we've cyclized it. Um, so one, because it lost its carbonyl, this breaks up to what's going to become an OH. Um, the exact timing of that might vary depending on whether you're an acid or base, but it's going to end up as an OH here as we make the hemiacetal. And then two, three, and four all have OHs, same as they did the whole time. And then five does not have an OH because that's what got used to close the ring. Um, but it does have a CH2OH for the tail end of the molecule that got left out of the ring. Okay, so this is the six-membered or pyranose form. Um, but we could just as easily have made a five-membered ring All right, so same molecule to start out with. OH is on the right, left, left, left. Okay. So we're doing the same thing, only we're making a five-membered ring here. So again, we start at the carbonyl, one, two, three, four, and then five is now this oxygen that's going to come around and cyclize on. So like that. So we're ending up with one, two, three, four, and then five is the oxygen here. Okay, so again, carbon number one had the carbonyl that gets turned into an OH group. Two and three both have their OHs still unchanged. Um, four has now the entire bottom part of the chain coming off of it. Um, if you want, you can show stereochemistry, but we're kind of neglecting it for now. So you could possibly show it like that if you wanted to. Okay, so five and six membered rings both form pretty easily. Um, and so this thing is sort of in equilibrium so long as it's under conditions where you can make hemiacetals. Um, at all times, it's in equilibrium between the pyranose form and the furanose form and also the linear uncyclized form. Okay. Um, and for both cyclic forms, you can tell which one used to be the carbonyl. Um, So carbon one used to be the carbonyl because in both cases, it's the only carbon in the whole molecule with two bonds to oxygen. So it's neither getting oxidized nor reduced during this reaction, and so it should still end up in the two bonds to oxygen oxidation state, which it does. Okay, um, so any questions about that? Okay, cool. So that's like the basic connectivity idea of what's going on here. It's all chemistry we've seen before, just now we're tying it together with a whole lot of additional stereochemistry. Um, so we need some way to show where the OHs are actually pointing based on where they are in the Fisher projection right now. So this is what Hayworth projections are for. So they're for showing stereochem in the cyclic forms. Okay. So what we're going to do, there's, I guess, several valid ways to do this, but there's sort of one commonly, like, traditionally used way. So I'm going to follow that, just so we're all sort of on the same page. Um, okay. So... What we're going to do is take the Fisher projection and 
And if you remember, the Fisher projection is sort of like every bend along the backbone is curling in the same direction. So what we're doing is sort of looking down on the outside of this like bridge-shaped or curl-shaped arc here when we're looking down at the Fisher projection. Um, what we're going to do to make the Hayworth projection is take this Fisher projection, this big curvy arc thing, and flop it over to the right so we're seeing sort of a backward C. Okay, um, or sort of a sideways C, I guess, depending on how you draw it. Okay, so what that means for our stereochemistry is that any groups that were on the left in the Fisher projection ends up pointing up in the Hayworth projection. Conversely, right on the Fisher projection. Means down in Hayworth. Okay. So, okay, in the notes I sort of have all the instructions and then like demonstrating how to do this. Um, I'm going to work through one example instead as we go along. So, Say we're looking at a shorter chain, just so it's easier to work with. OK, so I got three stereo centers. What I'm going to do is take this sort of archy bridge shape, push it over to the right. so that I end up getting so okay so each of the three stereo centers on the Fisher projection ends up like we're not really showing it tetrahedral. We have a bar that's going sort of vertically here. Um, that's again sort of a formalized way of showing stereochemistry without it necessarily being realistic for bond angles. Um, but so I have the carbonyl here. Um, this stereo center here is this one, the first after the carbonyl. OH was on the right there, so it's going to be ending up pointing downwards. H is up. Then on the next one along, OH was right, so now it ends up down. And then in the last one, OH was to the left, so it ends up pointing up. And then at this bottom one, it's not a stereo center, so I could show that pointing any which way and it doesn't really matter. Okay. So questions about that so far? Okay, cool. So next what I'm going to do is figure out which OH group I'm going to be cyclizing onto. And that's something where if I just gave you this and said cyclize it, you wouldn't necessarily know which one to use. I would have to say make a five-membered ring or make a six-membered ring or make the Perinos or Furinos form. And that would tell you what to do. So... pick which OH to cyclize onto. Um, so numbering is helpful here. Um, if I said make a five-membered ring, it's going to be the OH on the third carbon after the carbonyl. which you can sort of tell by 
if I want to make a five-membered ring, it's got to be one, two, three, four, and then five for the oxygen. So it's the OH on the third stereocenter away from the carbonyl. Okay. Um, if it's a six-membered ring, it's going to be the next one along, obviously. Okay. So um, this doesn't change anything in the Hayworth projection just yet, but what we're going to do next is going to change things possibly. So step three here is, if necessary, rotate that OH into position so it's pointing at the carbonyl. So what we're going to do is redraw what was up here. Okay. So same thing is up there. So the OH I'm going to use, and again, numbering might help. So one, two, three for five for a five membered ring. This OH is the one that I need to have pointing right at the base of the carbonyl. So what I'm going to do is the bond before that, I'm going to twist that around. Um, So I'm spinning around the carbon-3, carbon-4 bond. So what I'm going to redraw this as is like everything before that in the chain stays the same. OK, so that's still down. That's still down. But here I have a carbon-4. I'm going to rotate it, and I'm still going to show it as like one thing arching back around to like make the ring, and then like something up, something down. But I'm going to have this OH sort of pivot into position, so it's where this CH2OH group is now. And that's going to go down to where the H is now. So it's going to look weird because the bond angles are not consistent, um, but it helps to bear in mind that we're just showing this as like a formalized version of tetrahedral geometry that's not looking tetrahedral, but that's kind of what we're representing. So we're going to rotate this OH to here so that now it's sort of in position to close a ring down in plane, um, which we'll do in the next step. And then this CH2OH comes down to the underside, and this H pivots all the way up onto here. OK, so that's probably the trickiest part to see. Um, any questions about that? OK, cool. All righty, so now that we've done that, what we're going to do is take this OH and cyclize by forming the hemiacetal. OK, so I'm going to close up a five-membered ring here. Um, So I'm going to show, again, the front part of the molecule hasn't changed. But I'm just sort of linking together at this OH at the back um, to make a five-membered ring here. OK, so that stays the same from the previous step. That stays the same. OK, so there is one question that we don't have any information about just yet, and that is, what's going to happen at this stereo center that we're just newly creating? Because it was trigonal planar geometry, and now it's becoming a tetrahedral stereo center. We're actually going to get two possibilities out of what happens at carbon-1 now. You could have the OH sticking up and H down, or we could have OH down and H up. Okay. 
Okay. So this one here is a newly formed um, stereo center. So it can be either R or S. In other words, the OH can be up or down. OK, so that one actually gets a special name. Um, it's, again, the only carbon with two bonds to oxygen in the whole deal. Um, and this is actually called the anomeric carbon. Okay, so these two forms um, are a type of epimer, which if you remember from last time, epimers are two stereoisomers where only one stereocenter is different. So they're identical except for this one stereocenter. So these are epimers. But they're also a more specific type of epimer. They're an epimer where the only difference is at the anomeric carbon. Um, so another name for the relationship between these two molecules is anomers. OK. So pretty much we're going to have some proportion of this form versus that form getting f produced when we do this reaction. They are still diastereomers. So anomers are a subset of epimers, and epimers are a subset of diastereomers. Um, but there's pretty much no way, um, given the chemistry that we have access to, to force it to be one chirality or the other reliably. Um, if you're in biochem and, or uh, if you know, you're working with enzymes that can very specifically guide molecules to react a certain way, then that can sort of favor one epimer or one anomer over another. Um, but based on just sort of crude benchtop chemistry where we're forming hemiacetals, um, since we're making a new stereocenter, it's going to be a little harder to control. Okay, um, so questions about these? Yeah? So in the notes, you have a yeah, um, so I guess in the notes I sort of drew it so like the front side of the ring is thicker lines, so it's coming out towards you and like these things are sort of bolded as well. Um, if you want you can show it that way, but technically kind of like Fisher where there's implied stereochemistry based on positioning. Um, same thing here, like you don't actually have to show it, it's still perfectly fine if you just have it like all lines in plane. Yeah, so I pretty much drew the bolding just to make it like a little bit easier to see, but I don't know if I stick with that for the entirety of the notes. It looks like I sometimes do. So, yep. <laughs> okay, good question. Um, any other questions about that? Uh huh. So, the position of the CH2H in the matter, do you put that up or down in terms of the mechanism? Um, so, only in terms of you have to rotate it the correct direction to get the OH in the ring. And so, that's going to sort of affect where this guy ends up pointing. So it may end up pointing up or down depending on where this OH ends up like needing to rotate or how it needs up and end up needing to rotate. Um, and so in this case, because we have to pivot the whole thing like clockwise at the back, then this whole tail gets pushed to the downward position. So yeah. OK, other questions about that? OK, so let's do one more example on this molecule. Maybe let's do a six-membered ring. Okay, so same thing again. Okay, so flop this thing over to the right and you get, just like before,
Okay, so if we want to make a six-membered ring, then we're going to use carbons one, two, three, four, five, and then the oxygen that we're going to use is atom six there, which is just that one. So in this case, if we pivot that into position, nothing else really has to change because um, that's not a stereo center, and so we can just twist and turn around the carbon-4, carbon-5 bond, and like nothing really changes. We don't have any stereochemistry here that we have to worry about because there's just two other H's coming off carbon-5. So that makes things easier for us. Okay, so now when we go to cyclize, we're making a six-membered ring. So pretty much all the stereo centers get drawn the same way the whole way through. And so we do still have to worry about the anomeric carbon, though. It could be an OH up, an H down, or it could be OH down and H up. Okay, so questions about sort of this example. I went through that pretty fast. Uh-huh. When you're writing out products for this, do you have mm -hmm. to write both? Mm -hmm. Unless I specify which one specifically, because I would already have to specify, like, make the five-membered or the six-membered ring. And I may also give you information about, like, make one of these or the other, which we'll get into how to identify those in just a second. So. Okay, so any other questions about this process here before we go on to more details about it? Yeah. So, um, are you changing where you're rotating depending on whether you know you want a six-member ring? Exactly, yeah. So depending on like which OH I choose to be the one to close the ring, which is sort of what sets five or six-member rings, um, that will determine like what kind of pivot I have to use in order to get it pointed in the right direction. So like here, I, it was really easy because I didn't have any stereo centers that got affected by that. But here, I had to like... Um, sort of change everything from carbon four onwards and that sort of swung some stuff around. So okay, yeah. We also assume it's always happening in acidic conditions where we can protonate it. Um or basic where you could theoretically deprotonate this one at any particular time and close the ring down. And really you could deprotonate anywhere but um <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, because it's usually an aqueous, so it could pick up a H from the um, conditions afterwards, yeah. Yeah, I think like acidic is probably faster, just because protonating the carbonyl sort of opens up a lot more options than waiting for the right OH to get deprotonated, but I'm not real sure about how the kinetics work out, I guess, yeah. Okay, um, so let's talk some more about the anomeric carbon, because that actually matters a fair bit. Um, so, um, we actually use two different terms to describe which um, anomer is getting formed. Um, so the two forms that we're making are the alpha and the beta form. Um, so... So for an L sugar, in other words, for something where the OH on the bottom of the chain is in the left side, or I should say OH on is on the left, um, so long as you follow this pattern for Hayworth projection, like flop it over to the right and draw it sort of this way around. Um, the alpha anomer has the OH pointing up. 
beta enamer has OH pointing down at the enameric carbon. Okay, so for this particular one, it's an L sugar. OH is on the left there, on the lowest stereo center. So when we flop this over and cyclize it, this form where the OH is up, this is the alpha form. This one where the OH is down is the beta form. And we can actually add that onto the name of the type of ring that we're making. So we already know this is the pyranose form, the six-membered ring. So this would be the alpha pyranose form of whatever sugar I started out with there. I'm not covering the common names of sugars, but alpha pyranose form of whatever OS sugar that we have. And this is the beta pyranose form of whatever OS Okay, so in the L form, alpha's up, beta's down, but we know that L and D are, for the same sugar, they're going to be mirror images of each other because they're enantiomers. And so for the D sugar, it's going to be the opposite of that. So alpha is down, beta is up. And so since we're more frequently going to see D sugars, because those are the more common natural form, um, like just remembering alpha is down might be sort of more helpful there. But on paper, we might see either one. OK, so say we're looking at maybe let's keep the rest of this molecule the same. and just flip the lowest stereo center, so we're changing it to a different D sugar. Um, if we want to <clears throat> go through the whole steps again for cyclizing it, I'm more or less copying what I have up there. Okay, but now I have um, OH down, OH down, OH down. And so if I want to make like the pyranose form of one of these, um, I'm going to rotate that into position and go attack the oxygen. end up with OH down, OH down, OH down. And then I can have either OH down here at the anomeric carbon. So this is the alpha pyranose form because it's a D sugar. Plus OH up, which would be the beta pyranose. OK, and I can do the same thing for the furanose, or the five-membered ring forms. Like since this one, I'm starting out with an L sugar. Here, alpha is up. So this is alpha furanose form of whatever it is. And this is the beta furanose form. OK, so another way to remember it that might stick better is um, when you look at the not yet cyclized but starting to get there kind of form, um, the carbon that, or the stereocenter that determines D or L here is going to be down for the D sugar.
And so if your anomeric OH ends up pointing the same direction as that, in other words, down the way I have it drawn, then that's alpha. If it's pointing the opposite direction, then that's beta. And that relationship is going to hold true no matter which like D or L you're looking at. Like here, the OH that determined D or L was up. And so alpha is going to be the same one that's also up on the OH. So if that makes it easier to remember, then that's kind of the way to simplify it down. OK. Um, so a lot of stereochemical conventions going on there. Yeah? Could you determine if what you just said, you did that before you wrote the molecule? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry to cut you off there. But yeah, it's uh, pretty much before you actually do any of the spinning around stuff. It's the way it's pointing right after you flop the molecule over. Yep. Yep. OK. Other questions about that? OK. Cool. Uh, Okay, actually, I guess one thing, mm, so I guess I sort of described these as epimers. Um, they're a little bit different from epimers now that I mention it, just because they're not like permanently locked into one form or the other. Um, you know what, just so we're all on the same page, I think I'm going to erase that sentence. Um, I don't think I have any erasers up here, but <laughs> okay, so yeah, sorry, that's what I get for getting ahead of myself in the notes, but these are enomers. Um, they're not really permanent epimers, so we don't consider them like sort of permanently locked into one form or the other. Um, But they are sort of looking like epimers temporarily. But because they're in equilibrium and can freely interconvert, they're not sort of locked into any particular stereochemical relationship to each other. OK. So I guess the take home message from this part is we started out with this one parent linear carbon, or linear hydrocarbon, or carbohydrate. Um, we started out with this parent chain. And we ended up forming four different cyclic forms out of it. We formed the alpha furanose, the beta furanose, the alpha pyranose, and the beta pyranose up there. Plus, we have the starting thing. So if you sort of leave this thing alone in water, especially if there's acid or base around, um, it's going to interconvert between all five forms kind of freely. Um, so linear or acyclic alpha pyranose, beta pyranose, alpha furanose, and beta furanose. And where the actual equilibrium lies between all five of those forms kind of comes down to what's the most stable, what the particular conditions favor, temperature, stuff like that. Um, and so we don't have any great way to predict out of the five, like which is going to be more favored. Sometimes it's just a mixture of them all. Um, so the process of interconverting between all the five forms is called muta rotation. And um, so it's catalyzed by acid or base, just like hemiacetal formation. But it can very slowly happen in neutral water, too.
Okay. So this is just something that carbohydrates do freely just because they have the functional groups for it and um, a lot of the time it ends up being more stable to be a cyclic compound than a li linear form. Uh-huh. So whenever you're tapping, whether it's L or D, you have mm -hmm. Uh huh. Wait, sorry. Um, you're looking up up here. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Um, sort of. So I guess like the OH at the anomeric carbon has to be on like for alpha, it has to be on the same side as where this thing was originally pointed before we started doing any rotations around anything. So it's sort of like before we actually start messing things up by spinning it around, like take a quick look at where it's pointing now and then remember that direction and compare it to like the anomeric OH over here and that determines alpha versus beta. So. Okay. Is that covering what you're... Uh, I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Mm. Um, well, that's more down to like whether you're making a five or a six membered ring. And so um, that's kind of like which OH you pick to do it. But yeah, like before you ever bring rotations like into spinning part of the chain around, kind of like before that is when you want to check out the lowest stereo center and then do the comparison to where things end up later on, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, it's, um, that's kind of one way to remember it is comparing to like where the LRD stereo center is pointing. The other way is just um, for L, alpha is up, beta is down, and for D, alpha is down, beta up. Um, I guess whichever one sort of is easier to remember too might be the way to learn it, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, okay, um, so other questions about that? Okay. All right, so in the last few minutes that I have left, um, I'm going to get a little bit into some other chemistry that we can do with these carbohydrates. Okay. So, um, Pretty much the only reaction that we've actually done in this chapter so far is hemiacetal formation, which is something that we've seen before. Um, we've also seen that in the enols and enolates chapter, um, if you have a stereocenter that's one away from a carbonyl at the alpha carbon, um, it can get its stereochemistry scrambled pretty easily. Whether that goes by the enol or the enolate kind of depends on conditions. But we saw that if you have this thing where there's an H implied to be there. You can actually make the enol or the enolate real briefly there. And then when you come back out of that, this form has lost all of its stereochemistry at that carbon, so it could just as easily come out of that with its methyl group dashed as bold, and then the H is just going to adjust to where it needs to be to compensate. Okay, so what this means for um, for our carbohydrate stuff is that if we start out with a Fisher projection that looks like, say, this, mm -hmm. 
we can accidentally end up making a double bond here and then we're actually losing stereochemistry at that carbon and so when we come back out of that we could have the OH here one away from the carbonyl pointing the wrong direction okay so on top of all the like Fisher projection and Hayworth projection stuff we have to worry about um, the Fisher projection itself is not necessarily going to be locked in stone just because some of the stereo centers on this chain can actually flip to their opposite okay so we're going to cover this and something else that can happen as a complication uh, more next time. Hi. Uh -huh. How did you rotate it so that the oil Uh -huh. um, oh, I could have shown that as a separate step, just I was sort of rushing through a little bit to, so I combine like these two steps into the one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.